All right, we should be recording. Hopefully it'll work. Otherwise we'll be doing it again. Um, so um, we're gonna have Sarah do her presentation on Head Start and then we're gonna roll with our um, nuts and bolts training. So take it away, Sarah. Perfect, thank you, Barbara. Um, are you okay with transitioning through the slides yep. as I let you know that you can go on to the next one? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So hi, everybody. My name is Sarah. I am from Head Start at Community Action Partnership of Ramsey in Washington County. I am the Recruitment and Outreach Coordinator for Head Start and Early Head Start programs. Um, so I'm just here today. I'll hopefully only be taking up about, you know, 15 minutes of your time, just giving you kind of an overview of what Head Start is. Um, are any of you familiar with Head Start services already? Maybe, maybe not. If not, that's totally fine. Um, I'm here to just give you give you an overview, um, kind of just about our program options, eligibility, and how you can support um, your your child with enrollment. So, Barbara, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. So, what is Head Start and Early Head Start? Head Start is a child and family development program for children under five and pregnant individuals within Ramsey County. Um, all of our programs operate at no cost to the parent. Um, our programs focus heavily on family development and holistic whole family support. Every family that is participating in Head Start programs gets assigned a family advocate that works with the family um, on meeting personal goals for things like education, employment, parenting skills, housing, um, and can provide access to and referrals to community resources. Family advocates support our participants with accessing community resources and our, speak, our staff speak multiple languages in order to provide the best assistance for families. Um, in our program, we have, yeah, we have staff that speak a multitude of languages in the centers and as well as our family advocates. Um, and in the classroom, children are encouraged to learn their home language as well as English. So we have that, that all around support. Um, you can go to the next slide, Barbara. Thank you. So like I said, in Head Start, we focus on the child's overall development. Um, as part of our enrollment process, we assist the child and family with getting an up-to-date dental exam, an up-to-date physical. Um, that's part of our enrollment process. Um, we focus on developmentally appropriate curriculum, and there's a heavy focus in Head Start on social-emotional learning as well. Um, families are provided with parent engagement activities multiple times a month. Um, there's like family fun events and parenting groups that we put on for families. And then um, we really work to encourage socialization with the families um, to try and like build that community with each other. Children that have, you know, IEPs or IFSPs or different health and developmental needs are supported and including in all, included in all of our classroom activities. We do have on-site at classrooms early intervention specialists and coaches that work with our teachers to help, you know, address any like behavior problems that might be happening in the classroom, but we really focus on being a very inclusive environment for children with all types of needs. Um, Head Start has the highest parent aware rating, and we're very committed to providing quality, comprehensive services that prepare children for success in school and life. Um, before I move on to some more details about what program options we provide, I like to just kind of give you some statistics and facts from the National Head Start Association about um, outcomes that are achieved by participating in Head Start programs. So uh, Head Start children are shown to have increased cognitive, social, and emotional development. Children are more likely to be immunized and meet other physical health markers if they've participated in Head Start. Head Start children are shown to have fewer behavioral problems and are 93% less likely to end up in foster care. And children who participated in Head Start are also more likely to graduate high school and attend some type of post-secondary education. So I really just like to kind of say those facts to just emphasize how big of a difference Head Start can make if the child participates when they're young. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So this is a map that shows um, where all of our Head Start centers are located. As you can see, most of them are in St. Paul, but we do have a couple that are a little bit outside of St. Paul. Um, the map is color coded to kind of show what different types of sites that we have. So for example, the red pins are where we operate our community action Head Start sites. Uh, the blue pins represent a few of our pre-K partnerships with a few different SPPS schools. The green pins are our community child care partnership sites. And then the yellow pins are just where some of our admin offices are. Um, an important thing to note is that sometimes things are changing and classrooms get moved around. For example, in this map here, we have our site up in Mounds View, up in the upper left-hand corner, but that site, unfortunately, is going to be closing and we're going to be opening a new location in the fall. So this is ever-changing, but this is just kind of to show a visual of where we're at in the area. Um, but if you're looking for the most up-to-date information on where our centers are located, you can um, check our website and I'll be providing that information at the end. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So our Head Start Extended Day program, I would say is one of our, is pretty much our, our biggest program that we offer. Um, this is the most common and probably what a lot of people think of when they hear Head Start. So this programming is for preschool aged kiddos um, ages three to five. This program operates Monday through Thursday and it runs with the normal school year. So September through June, and it's seven and a half hours per day. At the extended day program, children receive breakfast and lunch with a snack. Um, hours, are, hours of operation are either 8 to 3.30 or 9 to 4.30, just depending on which site. Um, some of them are just an hour one way or the other. Um, Head Start extended day services, um, like everything, operates at no cost to the parent, and this service option does not require any additional type of funding. Um, classroom sizes are between 17 and 20 children. And again, this is all three to five year olds. Bus transportation is available for the Head Start Extended Day program, um, but it is limited. So it's just something we're not able to guarantee. Um, but we do route our, we do our transportation routes in the summer. So we always say like the earlier that you apply, um, it's, you know, more likely that we'll be able to get you on a transportation route, but it's just something we, we can't guarantee. Um, but parents or family members are always encouraged to self-transport their child to the center if they have the ability and the means to do so. So that's our extended day. Um, Barbara, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the next program option that we have for the preschool age children, so three to five, is our full day, full year programming. So our full day, full year sites operate kind of more like child care centers where they run Monday through Friday. They have longer hours, so they operate from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, at the full day, full year sites, children also receive meals and snacks throughout the day. One thing about the full day, full year sites is they do require an additional set of funding, such as childcare assistance through the county or an early learning scholarship like Pathway One. Um, we do have a subsidy administrator that works in our main office that can help support families with navigating these funding sources. Um, but CCAP is, you know, always applied through the county and then Pathway One. There is different area administrators that distribute these scholarships depending on what county you live in. But for uh, Ramsey and Hennepin County, they're distributed through um, Think Small. So you may have heard of Think Small before, um, and they are the ones that distribute the early learning scholarships. One more thing about full day, full year is that transportation is not provided for this program. And so parents or family members are required to self-transport their child to this, this program option. Um, and at any time, if you have any questions about these program options or if anything comes to mind, feel free to just unmute and um, just ask. Otherwise, there'll be time for questions at the end too. So um, you can go ahead to the next slide. All right, so now we're moving on to early Head Start. So a lot of families I've realized um, aren't familiar with our early Head Start program. So 
oftentimes when people think of Head Start, they just think of preschool, right? They think of ages three to five, um, but we actually do have an early Head Start program that serves um, children ages birth to three. So I can start by explaining our home-based program. So our early Head Start home-based program, um, again, is for children ages birth to three. And this home-based home program is also offered to pregnant individuals as well. So in this program option, each family gets 90-minute um, home visits once a week from a family support specialist. So these visits support parents and family members through a parenting education curriculum, um, provide referrals to community resources, information and education about physical and mental health, dental health, nutrition, um, and they aim to support just early, overall early childhood development through fun activities between the child and the caregiver. This program option also offers twice monthly family fun events that parents are encouraged to participate in. So this is a really great program, maybe if the family doesn't have transportation, or maybe they're not quite ready to send their little one to a classroom or to, to childcare, but they still want that support in the home. Um, this is a really, a really great program. And this home-based program does not require any additional funding. So this is just operates no cost to the parent. And then moving on to the next slide, our final program option is our Early Head Start Center-based. So this is um, center or classroom-based programming for infants and toddlers. And so our infant classrooms are six weeks to 16 months, and then our toddler classrooms are 16 to 36 months. So this is another full day, full year program. So it operates the, the same hours as the preschool full Full day full year so 7 30 to 5 30 p.m monday through friday um, children are provided with free diapers and wipes and formula and meals throughout the day in these classrooms and these classrooms have a very low child to teacher ratio so there's um four children for every one teacher and so they get a lot of individual attention um, and just like all of our programs, the family receives support from a fa family advocate, an early intervention specialist, and our health team. Um, and so since this is another full day, full year program, this program option does require child care assistance or Pathway 1 funding, um, and transportation is not available, so parents or family members are required to self-transport to this program. All right. Does anyone have any questions about those four program options? I know it's a lot of information, but we went over the Head Start extended day for ages three to five, the Head Start full day, full year for three to five, and then those two early home-based, um, early Head Start options. Does anyone have any questions about those so far? No? Okay, great. We can move on to the next slide then. So something that Head Start, or at least the Head Start program in Ramsey County started doing, I believe this is our second year, um, we have a few partnerships with St. Paul Public Schools. So we offer no-cost Head Start pre-K slots within three SPPS elementary schools. So these are Eastern Heights and Highwood Hills and Expo for Excellence. So one of the really great things about this program is that the children that are in our Head Start slots, we, we operate in like a mixed delivery system. And so the Head Start slots are integrated in the classroom with children that are not in Head Start slots, but the kiddos that are in our Head Start slots, they get all the benefits of being a part of Head Start. So they get um, support from a family advocate, opportunities for parent involvement, they get support from our health team, um, they get all that wraparound support while being like integrated into the SPPS pre-K. Um, and then children that are in this program, it often makes them makes it a little bit easier for them to like transition into kindergarten if they want to stay at that elementary school. So it's a really cool program. Um, and transportation for these partnership site programs that's all coordinated by SPPS. So if the family lives within the busing zone, then they would, you know, work with SPPS to secure the busing transportation. All right. 
So those are all of our program options. Um, so now I can just kind of talk about eligibility for our programs. So in order to be, you can go to the next slide. Sorry, I forgot to say that. So for a family to be eligible for Head Start, there are quite a few different ways that, um, that they can be eligible. So I'm here talking to you all today because you are either foster parents already or interested in becoming foster parents. Um, and having a child in foster care is automatic eligibility for Head Start. Um, and that does include kinship care. So that's one thing that um, we're really just trying to get that information out and let people know that foster families are eligible for Head Start, even if you don't meet any of these other requirements like income or um, receiving public assistance. So we're just here to make sure that you know that this, you know, Head Start programs are available to you and your child. Um, families can also be eligible by receiving some type of public assistance like SNAP, MFIP, or SSI. Um, within the last couple of years, it just recently changed that we could use SNAP as an eligibility. So that has been really great in opening the door for this program um, for more families. A family can be eligible um, also by receiving or experiencing homelessness. Um, we use the McKinney-Vento definition of homeless, homelessness, which just means having a lack of fixed, regular, or adequate housing, and that includes living in a shelter, couch hopping, or in doubled up housing. Um, and then families are also eligible if they're living at or below 100% of the federal poverty guidelines. And we do have a limited number of over-income slots available as well. Um, but Head Start, in Head Start, we do work to prioritize like the neediest of the needy children in our community. So now just talking about um, how to show eligibility. So eligibility documentation, which is on the next slide. So during the enrollment process, we would need to verify the family's eligibility. Um, if the child is in foster care, we would just need a placement letter from the foster care worker, or if it's like a kinship care situation, we would need um, like a DOPA, the, I think it's delegation of parental authority letter, we would just need that to show um, that, you know, the, the person has, you know, legal right to make decisions about the, per the child's care. Um, but that's, that's what we would need if the child's eligible through foster care. Um, if the family is eligible through the category of receiving public assistance, we, um, if they're eligible through SNAP, we can literally just take a picture of their SNAP card and that's enough for them to be eligible or um, like a letter showing that they're receiving MFIP or SSI. If the family is eligible per homelessness, um, the family would need to provide a letter from a homeless liaison or have their address be on um, one of the like known shelter addresses and we keep a database of what those addresses are. Um, there's also like a self-declaration self of being homeless as well um, that the family can fill out. And then if the family is income eligible, we would need um, pay stubs, W-2s or a tax form to show income. And then once like we're through the application and the eligibility process before the child is placed, um, we would need like proof of date of birth, a recent physical and an immunization record or exemption form. Um, but the immunizations can also serve as proof, proof, proof of birth date. So we really try to be as low barrier as possible. Um, we know that there's a lot of hoops that families have to jump through. And so we really try to make it as easy as possible to show eligibility um, and get families enrolled in our program. So on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the different funding sources. And so if you remember when I was talking about the different program options, um, our full day, full year class uh, center-based Head Start programs for um, both age groups, the three to five and the zero to three, those do require an additional source of funding. So the first additional source of funding that can be used is CCAP or the Child Care Assistance Program. And this is applied through um, the County of Residence. So CCAP provides child care assistance to families 
who have been on the MPIP or DWP program in the last 12 months um, and to others who may meet, meet income guidelines. One thing about CCAP currently um, is that CCAP currently doesn't recognize a foster child as being a part of their definition of family, but that is changing in August. So starting, I can't remember if it's the beginning or the end of August, but sometime in August, um, the CCAP definition of family is changing to include foster children. So that's going to be huge um, to open up that source of funding to more families. Um, Cause obviously not every family looks the same and they're trying to, you know, provide this benefit in a way that reflects that. Um, and then a early learning scholarship is the second option for funding for the full day, full year programs. So this would be a pathway one scholarship. Um, in Ramsey County, the area administrator for these scholarships are Think Small. So you may have heard of this organization. So Pathway One Early Learning Scholarships can help families cover the cost of quality childcare and preschool for young children. Early learning scholarships must be used at a parent aware rated program. Um, and I mentioned earlier that Head Start is a four star parent aware rated program and four stars is the, the highest rating for parent aware. So where we take this source of funding very frequently and we work very closely with Think Small um, and Think Small is currently prioritizing Pathway One applications for um, foster families. So helps expedite the process a little bit. Um, and then on the next slide, I'm getting close to wrapping up. So if you have any questions, feel free to blurt them out. But um, if you are interested in applying for your foster child, there's a, a few ways that you can go about that. So you can apply online at our website. It's caprw.org. Um, it's pretty easy to navigate through the website. You just go to the services tab and then down to Head Start. And then if you scroll down the page a little bit, there's a link to our online application. You can also call our enrollment hotline number, um, which is listed there. If you have any questions or need to submit like your eligibility documentation, you can send it to this email. It's hs hs-apps at caprw.org, or you can stop into our main office. Um, we're located on University and Hamlin, just right across from the Midway Target. Um, and you can stop in anytime Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And somebody will be in the office to assist with the application. Um, and then if you'd like you know, me to send you an application, I have my contact information on, on the last slide and you can always reach out to me directly too. Yeah, so that is my presentation about Head Start. Um, if you are looking for other childcare options, maybe um, you know don't wanna use Head Start services for some reason, you can always go to Parent Aware and they have a search to find other high quality childcare that falls under their like rating system. Um, if you have any specific questions about the funding, like the CCAP or Pathway 1, feel free to contact me or our uh, subsidy administrator, Elizabeth Sherman. I have her information here. Um, she is the guru about funding. So even I ask her questions all the time because I'm still learning a lot of that stuff too. Um, and then, yeah, if you ever have any questions in the future, feel free to contact me and I, um, yeah, does anyone have any questions that I can help answer about Head Start? No? If I was just gonna say that, you know, yeah. childcare costs can be a real barrier to um, the success of foster care placements. So this is a really good information to keep in your back pocket. Um, so I think even if people don't have questions now, this is really good information to tuck away um, because it may come in handy at some point. So um, if you're if you're going to um, be caring for younger kids, please um, hang on to this information. It could really be useful. Absolutely. Uh, this is Robin. Uh, I just have a question about is there deadlines like um, I'm not sure. Uh, we may be getting our um, 
foster child in the next month or so? Mm -hmm. Is there deadlines to filling out these applications? Yeah, so you can fill out an application year round. We accept applications year round. Um, for our extended day program, that's the one that ends in June and then starts back up in September. We do stop enrolling. Um, I believe it's at the end of April for like this current year, but you can still apply to get in um, in the fall. And then for the full day, full year program, we stop enrolling for the current year I believe in early, either late May or early June. Um, but same thing. It's 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 more so like a soft deadline for us to be able to stop enrolling for the current year, make sure that we have our slots filled for the current year, and then start planning for the next year. Um, but you can still apply anytime. It's more of just a deadline of like you might not be able to get in in this current program year, but you can still apply and get in um, for the fall. And then um, you said that uh, are all of the programs um, except foster children um, are without payment or do we have to make additional payments like for like the, ex the all day extended um, going through the summer months? Yeah, so all of our programs operate at no cost to the parent. So the, the programs that require the additional funding, um, that would come through the child care assistance or the pathway one. Um, with the child care assistance, I would have to double check with Elizabeth on this, but um, this would also be a question for like your county worker. Sometimes there's like a copay that you might have to pay depending on your income, um, but it's still, wouldn't be like anything compared to the cost of paying out of pocket for the whole program. Um, but with the think small scholarship, nothing comes out of pocket. It's just, if you have like a copay that comes with the childcare assistance, but that would be a question um, more specifically for, for the County worker, they'd be able to tell you like, if any, if there would be a copay, but aside from that, it's all no cost to the parents. So we don't require to we don't require parents to pay for like diapers or food for the program or any of the like family fun activities. Everything is operates at no cost. And the do you um the copay is that based on uh the income, a percentage of the income, or is that that the yeah. um, parents make? Yeah, I actually don't know 100% how that copay is calculated um, because it is through um, it is like through the county that they would determine that. But I can definitely follow up with Elizabeth and then maybe send an email to Barbara and Naomi and get some more clarification on how exactly that's calculated and they could pass that information on to you if that's okay. That's fine. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate their presentation. It was very good. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And one thing that um, is cool to mention too, so with the Pathway One scholarship, oftentimes we hear of families going to other child care centers and child care is expensive. And so oftentimes that scholarship like won't last the whole year um, of child care. And so one really cool thing that Head Start does is that if a family is using a Pathway One scholarship and they run out of funding, like before the year is done, Community Action will like cover the cost for the rest of the year. So they won't like kick you out of the program just because your scholarship runs out. They will like cover that cost for the remainder of the year or until your renewal time for your scholarship comes up. Okay. So that's a big, a big difference between like us and, you know, other childcare. So I just like to like to plug that because it's a cool thing that, that the yes. program does. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you, Sarah. And if people think of other questions, like as we're going along in the training, we can save them and we can get in touch with Sarah and um, she can she can get back to us on questions too. Or you guys can also ask your licensors as you're rolling through licensing and, and we can get answers too from Sarah. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, we're staying in Ramsey County right now, but we plan on moving. Would that mm -hmm. change everything? The location and all that? For those, because yeah. there's three public schools out of St. Paul. I think. So, uh, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so our program specifically just serves families that live in Ramsey County, but there are Head Start programs all across the state of Minnesota. So even if you okay. move out of Ramsey County, it might just be through a different program, like Hennepin County has their own, Anoka, Washington has their own, um, but the the core of the services that are provided are, are the same. It would just be through like a different agency. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your time and I wish you all the best on your journey as foster parents. So if there's any other questions, um, Barbara and Naomi can send those my way. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Are you guys ready to get started on foster care? Everybody good? Are you comfy? Yeah. Got your, got your beverage, got your feet up. <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. Let's roll. Let's roll. Okay. So as I started to say earlier, this is this is an overview of um, you know, what it oops, we got to get back to the beginning. We're at the end of what it is to get licensed for foster care and what it looks like to be licensed for foster care. So it's it's an overview and orientation. Um, and like I started to say, if you guys think of questions, you don't want to forget the questions, just interrupt me, pop into the, you know, just unmute yourselves and ask, um, because I'd rather have you ask and get clarification on what I'm saying, rather than wait till the end and say, oh, gosh, I had something I wanted to know, but now I've forgotten what it was. So just please, let's keep it casual. Um, so you may be wondering, what am I getting into? What the heck is foster care? What, what are we all doing here? Somebody called me and said, can you take your niece or can you take your grandbaby or can you take your friend's child who, because your friend is having some struggles? Um, so what does this mean? Or maybe you're thinking, I wanna do a service to the community. I wanna help. I, I don't have any relatives who are in trouble, but I just wanna do this. But I'm not exactly sure what it is that I'm getting into here. So here's what we think about when we think of foster care. It is temporary for starters. We think of it as a temporary arrangement because our goal is always that we want we want families to be together. Okay, we're not trying to permanently disassemble families. Um, so we think of foster care as a temporary arrangement um, because um, parents or guardians are having a struggle and they're, something's going on that they can't um, safely parent their children at this time, okay? Um, and, and, and somebody's brought it to the attention of, of child welfare, okay? It's gotten to that point where somebody felt like we need to get um, the system involved, okay? Things, things are usually to a pretty, you know, a pretty desperate point when somebody's decided they got to call in the system. It's like, okay, family can't handle it anymore. We're, we're, we're to that point, right? And so um, somebody's brought it to the attention of child welfare, child welfare's gotten involved, and, but, but still always the goal is to, to keep the kids safe, to, um, to make sure they feel safe, loved and cared for while we are supporting the family's efforts to reunify or to reunite or to become whole. So that's where the foster family comes in. The foster family is there to keep those kids safe, to keep them feeling loved, to keep their world as normal as it can be in a really abnormal circumstance. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of read out what the rule, what the law, the statute says about foster care. And I know you guys can read, but sometimes it just helps to hear it. It's a 24 hour a day, it's 24 hour a day care of a child following placement by the commissioner or a licensed child placing agency with legal placement responsibility. 
Okay, that what does that mean? That means that it, it's a legal it's a legal thing. So it doesn't mean that I walk into your house and say I don't like what's going on here. I'm going to take these children. There has to be legal precedent for it. Okay. Um, pers pursuant to a court order, so there has to be a judge that stamps the rubber stamp and said, "Yep, I'm signing off on this." Um. Or, or a parent can, a, a voluntary placement agreement means the parent themselves might come in to us and say, I, I can't do this right now. I have too many problems. Either I have mental health problems. I have chemical health problems. I have domestic abuse problems. I have some kind of problem that I can't keep my children safe right now. And the parents can do a voluntary. Um, you know, voluntarily say, I want to put my kids in foster care right now because I can't keep them safe. So that's a voluntary placement agreement. Um, uh, anyway, back to the, in any facility that regularly provi provides one or more children when unaccompanied by a parent or guardian with a substitute for the care, food, lodging, training, education, supervision, or treatment they need, which for any reason cannot be furnished by a parent or guardian in the child's home. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what that's what foster care is. Do you guys have questions about that? About why we consider it temporary? Does it sometimes turn permanent? Do you guys think it sometimes turns permanent? Why would yes. it why would it turn permanent? Adoption? Adoption. Mm -hmm. And and when that happens, it's because a healthy relationship was uh created. Um the maybe they just kind of fit in um once like as they have grown into the family, um sometimes like relationships are built and um trust and things are like made. Um so it's more of a secure place, maybe. Correct. Or, but the only time that it would, and so. yes, Stephanie, that's true for sure. But the only time that an adoption would mm -hmm. happen is because it, the reunification with the parents would not be possible. We wouldn't just say, oh, the kid likes it here better than with their mom. That wouldn't be a precedent for adoption. It would, it would have to be because the parents were not able to say, to safely parent their children. Yes. Isn't there Sorry, a term for that? that. <laughs> Isn't there a term for that? Like parental rights are taken away or something mm -hmm. and they, yes. they, they can't legally have the children, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. But yeah. It's a whole legal process where the parents, we'll get into that a little bit. We're not going to get into that a whole lot because um, we're going to talk more about foster care than about the child protection kind of court process. But yes. There's a whole legal process for parents to try and um, mit basically mitigate what the safety concern is so that they can reunify with their children. And parents are given, you know, all the support, all the um, many, many chances and opportunities and supports and resources to mitigate those issues because children belong with their parents. And we always say, you know, a, a D plus parent, a deep, I'd rather be with my mom, even if she's a D plus mom, than not be with my mom, right? Most kids feel that way. So um, we try and get kids back with their parents. So not every mom has to be an A plus mom or even an A minus mom or even a C mom because we love our moms. So, and and different people have different feelings about that. Don't get me wrong, but, um, but that's kind of, that's what, that's what we do. Try and get kids back with their parents. Okay, any, any thoughts or questions so far? We good? So, 
getting licensed for foster care, it is a license. It's a license just like a teacher has a license, just like a social worker has a license. Who else has a license? Nurses. Nurses have license. It's a license. Um, and so there are different steps that you have to take and it's taken seriously, just like a license. Um, so there are, there are different things that you're expected to do. Um, and um, it's a process. And our job as a licensor, because sometimes people want to get this license and sometimes it's you're kind of thrown into it, right? It's not like I decided I wanted to be a social worker, so I pursued this. Sometimes you get a call and, and, you're, and someone says, can you take this child? And you say, well, yeah, but then I have to go out and get a license. So it's a little bit weird but you are required to get licensed, okay? That's the law. So we we're here to help you. Um, the pro it, so there are certain steps you have to take. We're gonna, we're here to assist you. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some effort. It's not like we say, it's not rocket science, but it, you know, it does take some effort. Now, everything you do, whether you're a relative who's taken in a child, or whether you're a non-relative who says, I wanna do this, all the steps are exactly the same. The only difference is if you are, if you're a relative, you're allowed to have that child in your home before you get licensed because that's an emergency placement. That child needs to be placed. Um, if you're a non-relative, you can't have a child in your home until you're licensed. So that's the only difference. But other than that, everything is the same. Um, so um, so th that's really the only difference. All the other steps are the same. Um, so this slide just kind of shows you like all the different statutes and laws and um, different agencies that are involved in the licensing process. And it's not anything you have to commit to memory. It's just kind of a, a visual to show you um, all the different things that are involved. There's Minnesota statutes and the primary statutes that we follow are 245A, 245C and 2960.30. Those are the, and like I said, you don't need to remember that, but that that's the Human Services Licensing Act. It's also the Background Studies Act, which we will, we'll talk about all this a little bit more in depth. Um, there are city and county ordinances that we have to follow. There's also building safety codes. Sometimes you have to get a fire inspection. Most people don't have to get a fire inspection, but some people do under certain circumstances. Ramsey County also has certain agency policies that we have to follow that are above and beyond even the state statutes um, because Ramsey County likes to go above and beyond with some things. Um, and, um, so those, you know, that that's the basic overview of all the different, um, requirements. What does that mean for you? Um, we'll get into that. Okay. This is, like I said, that's just kind of a visual for you to see, but I think what the takeaway from that is we don't make this stuff up. We're not, when your licensor comes in and says, oh, you're fine, you're, um, you have the wrong size um, fire extinguisher and you roll your eyes and say, isn't it enough I have a fire extinguisher? It's not because statute dictates what size of a fire extinguisher you have to have. Sometimes even we think some of this stuff is kind of silly, but it's statute, okay? And if you wanna see the statute where it says the size of fire extinguisher, we'll show you, you know? It's that kind of stuff. Or um, you have to have smoke detectors in certain locations in your home. And don't get me wrong, because most people already have, most people's homes are pretty much the way they need to be. Sometimes it's minor modifications, but this is just to kind of show you that we're not making this stuff up. It really is in statute. If you're ever curious about why we're asking you to do things a particular way, we're happy to show you where it is in statute. So please ask. 
Okay. Why do kids get placed in foster care? In case you're curious, what are the main reasons that kids wind up in foster care? Um, first of all, um, in Minnesota, um, over 4,000 kids and teens um, end up in foster care in out-of-home placement um, each year. So that's a lot of kids in foster care. Um, the the most of them are in foster care due to parental substance use disorders. Um, so we know that um, drug addiction and drug use is a, is a problem. And there are a lot of parents who are not able to safely parent due to their substance use disorders. Um, and then a smaller percentage of kids wind up in foster care due to allegations of neglect. Perhaps some of that neglect might be secondary to substance use disorders, you know, but these are these are what how the reports come in. There might be secondary reasons for a lot of these things. 10% due to allegations of physical abuse. And then some kids wind up in foster care because of the child's own mental health issues. And the parent can't handle that child parent doesn't know what to do with that child. So the child winds up in foster care. So those are just some, some things to think about when you're thinking about, um, oh, I want to do foster care. These are, the, these are the types of traumas that children are suffering in their family homes. So when you think about doing foster care with kids, think about the trauma that they're bringing with them, right? Any, do you guys have any thoughts or questions at this point? Okay. Um, just a few more numbers to throw at you. Um, the average number of days kids spend in foster care, 400, over 400. So that's over a year. The average number of different foster homes kids um, are uh, spend time in, two to three. And sometimes that's because um, they re they go home with to their parents and then oops, they wind up back in foster care because something uh, has happened. Or it may just be because they are they are placed in a foster home, say they get placed in a foster home with grandma and then grandma says, you know what, this isn't working, I can't do this. And then they have to go to another foster home. What do you think that does to a child? And it's, I'm not trying to guilt anybody because sometimes things just don't work out, but what do you think the impact of that is on a child? It can be traumatizing. Yeah, it can be traumatizing. You can feel abandonment. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I think so, too. So it's kind of like tr more trauma on top of trauma, right? So, you know, our our goal in foster care is to really try and reduce those multiple foster care placements. Um, so we really want to work with our foster families to try and have successful placements, whether it's with relatives or whether it's with non-relatives. We really want um, our foster placements to work out. And so we as licensors want to be um, supportive to you and to help things go well. Um, and so we, we really hope that we can have good communication with our foster families and to help support you um, as best we can. And so, it, you know, having good communication with you, hearing from you, um, trying to figure out how to best support you is really important to us for, for your, you know, for your well-being as well as for the kids' well-being. Um, percentage of youth in foster care who are reunited with their families, almost 70%. That's really good, you know, but that means 30% aren't. Um, breakdown by age. Ages zero to five, 40% of kids in foster care are little kids. Um, 
ages 6 to 11 is 26 percent and then um, 12 to 18 is 34 percent i'm going to be honest though our biggest need in foster care is those teenagers our biggest need. So, um, and those are the kids who um, wind up being in foster care the longest and wind up having the most placements. Um, those are the really, really hard kids to serve. Um, and um, have the most trauma and, and the most symptoms of that trauma. So, um, and then breakdown by race. Um, we know that there's a racial disparity in foster care. We know that there, is, there are, um, there's a racial disparity. So in foster care, 37% um, of kids in foster care are African-American or black, 25% are white, 19% identify as multiracial, 10% Asian and 7% American Indian. Why do you think there's a racial disparity in foster care? And that's a loaded question, I realize. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Different cultural breakdowns like um, environments, um, um, like financially, just kind of different things like that. Mm, okay. Their background. Okay socio and economic uh, disparities or okay anybody else have thoughts about that yeah um unstable families unstable families mm -hmm. uh, mental health <clears throat> maybe yeah yeah what about um just straight up racism. Yeah. Some of that maybe. Yes. And and just maybe um interpretations of interactions, misinterpretations, you know, mm -hmm. that um you know kid, the way kids behave might be misinterpreted as being naughty when really they're not being naughty. Yep. Or the way parents act is interpreted as being angry when really they're just being loud. You know what yeah. I mean? So a lot of times too with, um, I personally work in a um, teen shelter um, and a lot of our youth that I have been in this, um, and fostered multiple different placements, um at that age they feel unwanted um and like i know too like things have changed just in society how just with communication um and so there's a lot of miscommunication happening within that mm -hmm. um, so yeah i think there's just maybe like there's some bridges that need to be gapped um as far as that and it's no one's fault it's just kind of like a lot, you know, you a lot of mental health now is in the foster care too, where mm -hmm. I guess you going in would maybe think I'm just kind of caring for this child until there's they can go home safely, but mm -hmm. then also not really realizing that they have those traumas um, yeah. as well. Yes, yes, I agree. And we know we know about systemic racism too, so that even people with good intentions mm -hmm. may just have biases that they're not aware of and um you know mm -hmm. that accounts for i think some disparity too so absolutely yeah um ramsey county has the highest rate of relative versus non-relative placements in the state so that you know that's a good thing that we're that we're working really hard to keep kids with relatives mm -hmm. We do extensive kinship searches and try and keep kids with family. So at least if they can't be with mom, dad, with their immediate family, that they can be with people that they know, that know them and that love them. So we're, you know, we're working hard on that. And there is data that shows that there is better outcomes for kids who remain in their family culture. 
you know. Mm -hmm. um, is that always possible? No, that's not always possible. And that's why we need really good, um, caring, safe, loving, non-relative foster homes too. And um, so we're very grateful and thankful for those homes too. But but we do, um, we are very, very thankful that we have, um, you know, that we're able to place many, many kids with family. Thoughts or questions about all that? Thanks for, thanks for piping in on some of that stuff. Um, I wanted to talk for a minute about LGBTQ kids because they're, when we're talking about disparities, there is a really huge disparity of LGBTQ plus kids in foster care. Um, and some of the reasons for that might be kind of obvious because, um, you know, there's really a disproportionate number of LGBTQ kids who um, get kicked out of their family home, don't feel, who leave their family homes for, because of feeling alienated or unloved in their family homes. Um, so there's, there's a lot of LGBTQ kids living on the streets or, um, you know, homeless um, and also in foster care due to um, abusive homes or um, being put out. Um, those kids also report feeling unsafe at school. Um, those kids also self-medicate with drugs and alcohol more, you know, at a higher rate than non-LGBTQ kids. So there is a real disparity of LGBTQ kids in the foster care system. So um, we have, a, you know, there, there are some points about how to talk to LGBTQ kids and help them feel like they belong and like they're wanted. To me, it's how you would talk to any child um, and maybe just, Think about it in terms of LGBTQ kids. Take the time to listen and be available to talk about anything. That that goes for any kid, right? Um, support mm -hmm. children, and I mean this uh, makes me think about teens, I guess. But support them through support their self expression by letting them make their own choices. Kids like to, you know, sort of be different, um, have wild clothing, hairstyles. Um, you know, piercings sometimes, whatever. Um, let them have the friends of their choosing. I mean, as long as those friends are safe, um, let them decorate their rooms how they want to, you know, that's their self-expression. And sometimes, yeah, they do it to tick us off, right? They do it because they want to get a rise out of us, but uh, we got to pick our battles. Um, practice respect for um, the kids in your life and in, insist that everyone who comes into contact with those kids also um, treat them with respect. So that means no off-color jokes about gender and, um, sec, you know, no gay jokes, no gender jokes, those types of things. Listen, I'm of a certain age where um, gender is really, <laughs> I struggle with getting those pronouns right sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I do my best, you know, and everybody needs to do their best. And hopefully kids will give us grace when we screw it up. But everybody has to do their best and make their make the effort. Um, allow kids to participate in activities that they want to participate in, reg regardless of what's gender normal or gender typical, you know, and educate yourself. Um, whatever, if it's LGBTQ history and issues, if it's um, robotics, if it's, you know, whatever your kid is interested in, um, educate yourself and be interested. Hey, um, Stephanie, can you mute yourself? Because we can hear your background noise. Thank you. Appreciate it. So yeah, just educate yourself on that stuff. If you have an LGBTQ kid in your midst, you ought to know that history because it's important history. Um, and, and it'll be important to that child to feel seen and heard and loved. But, but like I said, I think it's important whatever your kid is into or whatever your kid's identity is, um, make it important to you too. Do you guys have thoughts about that? 
anything to do with sex and kids is awkward sometimes, but you know. Okay. Let's get into some nitty gritty here. How, what do you need to do to be a foster parent? Well, you gotta be 21, okay? If you're a relative and you're not quite 21, like we've had some big sisters and big brothers wanna take in their younger siblings, we can do variances for that. If they're like 19, 20 years old, we've done variances for that to make it work. But basically the law says you have to be 21. Any marital status will do. Single, widow, divorced, anything goes, okay? If you are married though, both partners have to be on the app. You both have to be licensed. If you are domestic partners, in other words, anything other than like completely platonic roommates, you both have to be licensed. Um, I've licensed people who have said, we're married, but we're not, it's not really like a marriage. You still both have to be licensed. Um, or we're, we're, we used to date, but we don't really date anymore, but we still sleep in the same bed. You both have to be licensed. <laughs> so, I mean, there's all kinds of weird partnerships, but unless you're like literal roommates, you both have to be licensed. So if it's a weird situation, we can always talk about it and sort through it, but domestic partners both must be on the license. Um, you can own or rent your home. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you live unless it's like, yeah, I'm living in my mom's basement. Probably we can't license that, but most residences we can license. I mean, we'd have to license your mom. She would be the license holder. Um, but you can own a rent, house, apartment, duplex, whatever. You got to be able to clear a background check. And most people clear background checks. You can have a checkered past. Some people have checkered pasts. Um, there are a few things that are going to disqualify you from a background check. Um, they would be things like violent crimes, sex, sexual crimes. Um, if you have something like that on your record, you might want to talk to us about it. Uh, we will know, we will find out anyway, when we do the background check. So please, if you have something on your record, just talk to us about it and we'll sort through, we'll sort through that too. Um, but you do, everyone in the home has to do a background check. And then the last thing is family stability. If you um, are in an em emotional kind of turmoil at the moment, foster care might not be the right option for you. If you're going through a divorce, if your parent just passed away, if you, you know, if your job is like, I don't know if you're about to get fired or something like that. If, if, if your life is upside down right now, this is something you really need to think hard about because foster care will turn your life upside down. So, um, it's just something to think about and you can talk to your licensor about it, talk to your family about it, if this is really a good option for you. So just wanna make sure that um, you are in a stable place to be a stabilizing force for the children, child or children that you'll be caring for. Questions or thoughts about that? You guys good? Okay, so what happens? Somebody places a child with you or you say, I want to be licensed. Um, you will, if you're a relative, a social worker will come out and meet with you, bring you some information, help you log on to the electronic system and get you started with the application. Is that kind of how it's gone for people? Okay, if you're a non-relative, you will log on to the website, you get signed up for the training, you fill out the application, you get a licensor assigned to you. Once a licensor is assigned to you, and you guys can tell me if this has not been your experience, this is how it should be going. Once a licensor is assigned to you, we will get in touch with you, we'll schedule a visit, and um, 
will get you going with our electronic system is called Binti. And there's a slide on Binti a little bit later. Um, we'll get you going on the electronic system to complete the paperwork. We will ask you to fill out an authorization to start the background studies. Um, we'll start um, setting up regular meetings with you because we will want to get to know you to determine if you are a good option to um, be licensed for foster care. Um, and concurrently to that, we'll have you work on trainings. Um, we will um, help you get the paperwork done. So it's paperwork. We have to do a um, inspection of your home. And um, so trainings, home inspection, the home study consists of learning about your history, your life, your parenting style, um, things like that. And um, Naomi, if you can think of anything I'm forgetting, I think that's about it. Um, so that process can take, like I said earlier, three months or so, sometimes longer. Um, and then once you're licensed, um, we will continue to have ongoing contact with you about once a month for the first six months that you're licensed. And then we back off a little bit, but remember it's a licensure. So you have to maintain your licensure by doing ongoing training. You have to do 12 hours of ongoing training a year. And then after the first year, we do a relicense where your license has to be reviewed. And then, um, Every year after that, we either do a relicense or a licensing review. So licenses are good for two years, but we have to do a review of your license every year. So on the off year, we do a review, and then every other year, we, we renew your license. Some, some things that can hold up getting license are background studies. Sometimes they get delayed, and reasons for delays might be if you um, had a conviction in the past. Maybe you had a DUI. Maybe when you were 22, you um, had a breaking and entering, a burglary charge, or you know some misdemeanor on your record. Things like that can slow down um, your background study process that is not going to disqualify you from being a foster provider, but it is gonna slow it down. Another thing that can slow down your licensing is that we need three references from friends, families, coworkers, somebody in your life who can vouch for you. And those references, you have to like, sometimes you have to keep on those references. Hey, get your reference back for me. Um, and um, those references are, are a necessary part of getting licensed. You have to have three people in your life who will say good things about you. The other thing is the training. You have to do that training. And so the quicker you get that training done, the quicker you get licensed. Some people have very busy lives and have a hard time fitting that in. Other people get it done, bada bing, bada boom. Okay. So a lot of getting licensed depends on your motivation, your schedule, and your level of, you know, ability to get it done. So um, I think I mentioned most of this already, that the foster care license is a state license. It's administered through the counties. So we do all the work and the state signs the paper, basically. Now, if you, I know that Sorry, I can't see your names and I can't remember your names, but the couple kind of, who said that they were moving um, at some point. So if you move yeah. to a different county, yeah, if you move to a different county, um, you, then your license, we can transfer your license, but you'll have to go through some process with the new county. So we would okay. we would be able to transfer some stuff to the new county, but they would have to do some some things would transfer, some things wouldn't basically. Okay. So yeah, like you'd have to get a new background study. You'd have to do a new application. There's some things you'd have to do over, but we would work okay. with the, we would work with the new county to provide them what we could. 
Okay. 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 But if you had kids in your care, it would not disrupt anything with the children in your care. Okay. 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 Um, I already said that licensing requirements are the same for relatives and non-relatives. Um, I already said that everything that we do is based on statute and law. There is a foster care manual and we will, we provide that manual to all of our um, foster providers. Um, it's a, it's kind of a thick manual. I think it's like 75 pages, but it's laid out pretty well. And there's a, there's a table of contents. So like if you were interested in finding uh, what do I have to do to get respite, for example, it's pretty easy to flip to what you need. And also we are here as a resource to you. So we can answer questions as well. Sometimes I get frustrated when I have a question and I call, you know, someone for an answer and they say, it's on page 73 of your resource manual. Sometimes I just want the answer. And so we are here, we will help you get the answers that you need, but we will provide you with that manual also. Um, it's really important to follow the rules. Like I said, all these rules are statute and law and are, are you know, there's the, sometimes regulations and rules get a little tiresome, but they really are set up for the safety of the children in care and they are important to follow. Um, so we do expect that our foster providers will follow the rules. Um, so not following the rules of foster care could lead to consequences, such as we, we can and we do issue correction orders. A correction order is really just a piece of paper saying, hey, you didn't follow the rules. This is a reminder of what the rule is. Sometimes correction orders will come with some retraining. Okay, we might have you go through another training. Um, and um, sometimes it's just a reminder to do something, but it is, you know, it's a paper trail basically, and it gets put in a file and nobody really thinks about it again, unless something else happens, in which case it could lead to a fine or it could put your license at risk. Um, we don't always have to do a correction order. If there's a big, bad, ugly situation, we, you might put your license at risk right off the bat. So it's not like we have to do step by step. Um, but typically, you know, we're, we're more about support and retraining and help. We're not about, um, you know, stepping in and, and we're not punitive, but, but if something big and bad happens, um, you, you may put your license at risk if a child's safety is, is compromised. Questions about that? Basically, the bottom line is follow the rules. If you're not clear on the rules, please ask. <clears throat> what are the trainings? Okay, you're in one of them right now. You're in nuts and bolts. I don't even think nuts and bolts is listed on here. I, I got to fix that. Um, you also have to take a class, Introduction to Mental Health. That is a class that's required to get licensed. And then you also have to do some kind of mental health training each year that you're licensed. Okay, it doesn't have to be the one mental health class, but it has to be something that has to do with children's mental health. You also have to do a child passenger restraint training. We call it CARS. That's an acronym, but I can't remember what it stands for. Um, everyone who has children in their care up to seven years old has to take the child passenger restraint tra training. Okay, if you have ki a kid who's eight and up, you do not have to take that training. You have to take that training every five years as long as you have kids under the age of eight. You also have to take abusive head trauma and sudden unexpected infant death if you have children five and under. And again, you have to take that training every five years as long as you're caring for children five and under. The other classes you have to take are FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. That has to be taken every year. Okay, every single year. And we have a number of different FASD trainings so that you don't have to take the same training every year. You also have to take something called Comfort Calls. QPI is Quality Parenting Initiative. That's an organization who puts out this Comfort Calls training. And that's a class about um, working together with the bio parents in the best interest of the child. The orientation class, I guess that's this class. It's called Nuts and Bolts. There's another class called Normacy and Reasonable and Prudent Parenting. That's always a mouthful to try and say. That's a class just about how to help 
kids in foster care feel like plain old normal kids. So they don't feel othered while in foster care. And then there's a class called mandated reporter. What does it mean to be a man? Do you guys know what a mandated reporter is? Yeah, okay, most people do. Okay, yep. if you don't now, you will. Those are the classes. So you see, it's not a short list of classes you have to take. It's fairly, fairly significant. It's about, I think it's about 12 hours of training. So it's not like, you know, a huge commitment, but it's, it's enough that you have to take in order to get licensed. The good news is all of this training can be done from the comfort of your couch with one exception, the child passenger restraint training you actually have to show up to. By law, it is required as an in-person training. All of the other ones you can do from home, okay? It didn't used to be that way, believe me. It used to be show up to every single one, but now we can, since, I mean, the, maybe the only good thing that came of COVID was that all these trainings are remote now. Um, once you're licensed, uh, you have to do 12 hours of ongoing training. You have to do mandated reporter training every year. Like I said, you have to do men, a men, one hour of mental health training every year. You also have to do FASD every year. And then the rest of the hours, you can do what you want. As long as it's related to child well-being, child foster care, child mental health, um, LGBTQ, um, something that has to do with kids and kid well-being, we're pretty loosey-goosey with it. If you're not sure, just check with your licensor. But we we try and encompass a lot. You have to have 12 hours. Questions? Your licensor will help you get hooked up with all that training. So what if you have the trainings, for example, um, um, I work with Head Start. I already have like the child passenger restraint training already. So do I still have to do that one or that could be counted as part of this training? I'm guessing it can probably be counted, Josephine. Bring that information when you meet with your licensor and let your licensor have a look at it. Okay. Okay, it probably meets our requirements. Okay. Let us have a look at it and make sure. Yeah, because I've also done the abusive head trauma. We do it every year, so. That's fabulous. So you're mm -hmm. ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it probably counts. I Do you drive for Head Start? Do you do driving for Head Start? No, I'm a, an early childhood coach. Oh, okay. Okay. But you have to take the child passenger restraint training. Yes. yes. Yeah, it oh, probably okay. counts. But yeah. let us just take a look at it to make sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Background studies. Every applicant... And every adult household member has to do a fingerprint background study, okay? We have a system that we enter your background study into. Um, it's, and then it generates information to you and then you schedule the fingerprints and then you go down and get the fingerprints done. Um, children, age 13 to 17 also have to do a background study, but they do not have to do fingerprints. They just have to get entered into the system. Now, there's one exception to that. If kids have lived out of state in the past five years, then they also must do fingerprints. So if you've just moved here from Wisconsin, I had one provider whose daughter went to boarding school and her daughter had to do fingerprints. So there's a few weirdo exceptions like that, but for the most part, kids 13 to 17 do not have to do fingerprints. I've already talked about it. Not all offenses are disqualifications. Most are not, but on occasion, there might be an offense, a conviction that would disqualify someone from being licensed. There is due process. If you receive a disqualification, there is a, um, request for reconsideration, an appeals process, basically. So you can appeal any decision through Department of Human Services. 
questions on background studies? No, I don't have any. Okay. I've already done mine, so. Okay, good. Binti, I mentioned Binti a minute ago. Has anybody logged on to Binti? Do you guys know what this is yet? Yes, I you have. guys have. Okay, yes, okay. Yes. For those of you who don't know, Binti is our paperless documentation system, B-I-N-T-I. -I. Once you have submitted your application and it gets processed, you'll receive an email from Binti welcoming you to their system. And um, the password to log into Binti is Ramsey for kids, like it says on there. Binti, um, you know, it's not a perfect system, but it's pretty good. It's, I think it's pretty user-friendly. The best part of it is, is that there is tech support available all the time and they're really good. I don't know if you guys have used that chat function, um, but at the lower right-hand corner of the screen, it says chat. So if you ever run into problems, if you click that chat and type in what your question is, someone answers and helps and it's the best tech support I've ever experienced and probably will ever experience. So don't hesitate to use that. They're they're really great. Yeah, um, that too. Yeah, it's really really good. That's so, true. and your licensor again, your licensor can support you with your use of Binti. It really is not a difficult system to use. But you know, some some people are a little bit more averse to technology than others, and um, might need a little bit more support. So um, your licensor can help you with that too. But that is our system. And, you know, in, in using some of these technological systems, um, I've, I've really tried to wrap my brain around using technology and um, it, sometimes I feel a little resistant to learning new technologies. I'm not gonna lie. But as foster providers, um, you know, you guys are going to be having to learn technologies in order to support these kids, like Schoology. I, that's, the, that's the school system in St. Paul. I don't know what it is if you live in the suburbs, but in St. Paul, they use Schoology and scheduling doctor's appointments for kids and all these different online systems that we have to use in order to support children. So kind of thinking that Binti is just one more technological system that we have to learn to use in order to support the kids, you know, that, that we're supporting. So um, hopefully it won't be too difficult to learn and, and we're here to support you with it. So for those of you who are not relative providers, what is Ramsey County looking for? You know, I mentioned the disparity in teens that need um, foster care. We really are looking for homes that are willing to um, serve older kids and teenagers. Um, we have a lot of foster families who um, really want to have babies and little kids in their homes. Um, but what we, what we are really lacking are people who are willing to help out those older kids. Um, and um, also who are trauma informed because we know that, and I know that's kind of a catchphrase that gets thrown around a lot, trauma informed, but it really is, we really do need foster families, both relative and non-relative families who are willing to learn what does it mean to have trauma? What does it mean to be traumatized? And what can I do to help a kid who has experienced really deep trauma and who is acting out on that trauma, right? And when that kid is making me crazy, they're not doing it to make me mad, even though it feels like it. They're doing it because they're traumatized. So what? how can I put that in perspective? And how can I like manage and make this placement successful with this kid who's really having a hard time and making me have a hard time, you know? 
So we we really are looking for for people who are able to learn about the effect of trauma on kids and and can um, figure out how to manage that and help these kids. Um, we also want family want foster providers who can work with the families of origin, who are willing to work with the families of origin. Sometimes it might be your family. Or sometimes it might be a family that you don't know, um, but we want people who will work together with the families um, to, because it's in the best interest of the, of the child or children. We also need foster providers who are able, to, able and willing to take sibling groups. So like brothers, sisters, more than, more than one child, because our, we're really committed to keeping siblings together. Um, kids are already being removed from their parents. We don't want to separate siblings, you know. Um, also, we need homes that are LGBTQ friendly. We've already talked about the disparity of LGBTQ kids in foster care. And also, this might seem kind of silly, but we need foster families to provide transportation. We need families who are willing to drive kids places because we know kids need to be driven places. And a lot of times we get families who, who aren't super happy to do that, but kids, kids got to get around. So we, we need people who are willing to take that on. Questions or thoughts about that? You guys are a quiet bunch. <laughs> yeah. You're quiet. I hope you're taking it all in. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Some roles and responsibilities of foster providers. Providing kids with a safe and healthy family life that prov promotes their development. That's pretty basic. Um, supervision in accordance, not just with their age, but with their needs. So you might have, you know, an older child in foster care who really can't be left alone for whatever reason, maybe because of mental health reasons, maybe because you know, they self-harm or um, because of chemical health reasons or because they run away or uh, whatever reason. They might need, a, you know, just like enhanced supervision. So every kid will have a placement plan and foster parents get a copy of that placement plan um, that'll tell you what their supervision needs are. So, um, Foster parents are expected to follow those those placement plans. Um, so we, we just need um, supervision in accordance with, with what those needs are. And again, if you're not clear, if you're not sure, it's important to ask. Um, we need you to report incidents. What's an incident, you might ask. Um, an incident, I think we have a slide on what an incident is, but incidents are basically... Um, injuries that need medical attention, um, police interventions. So like if a, a child runs away and you can't find him and you have to call the police, that would be an incident. Um, if an illness rises to the occasion that medical attention is sought, or not medical attention, but like emergency room attention is sought. Um, so big incidents. And again, if you're not sure, just report rather than don't report. Um, we need um, the foster parents to respect the importance of the child's birth family to that child. And again, sometimes it gets complicated if it's your family also, and you're really angry about the situation, you got to keep that to yourself because that child loves their family. So um, you have to be careful about how you present your feelings about the situation. You have to facilitate parental visits and sibling visits, and to the degree that you can, extended family visits. Legally, we're required to do parent visits and sibling visits unless there's a legal precedent not to. For example, um, sometimes we don't do visits if there's sexual abuse or something like that. But, but almost always we do parent visits. Um, and we are legally required also to do sibling visits if siblings are not together. We're not legally required to do grandparent visits, auntie visits, extended family visits, but we want to keep those family connections. So to the degree that we can, we want to do that. 
Um, we have to keep data privacy. We have to keep information about the child and their family confidential. So we can't talk over the backyard fence to our neighbor about the situation. Things are HIPAA protected. We have to be careful with that. Um, we want, we need to act as a mandated reporter. You guys all nodded that you knew what that meant and you're also going to go to a training specifically about what that means too. Um, once you're licensed for foster care, you are a mandated reporter. You So you have, you don't get to choose. You have to act as a mandated reporter. Um, you also need to um, actively cooperate and maintain ongoing communication with the workers in the child's life, the placing working worker and the licensing worker. And then there's other people too. There might be a guardian ad litem, teachers, um, therapists, different, different people acting in that child's best interest. You also want to keep records on the child, that doesn't mean you're writing daily log notes or anything like that, but you wanna keep medical records. You wanna keep a file, either an electronic file or some kind of file of the records that you receive on that child, IEPs, different things like that. And then that we talked about the training requirements. Um, so I always tell people, don't wait until the month that you're getting licensed to think about, oh yeah, I gotta do 12 hours of training. Try and stay on top of that as the year goes on so that you're not like totally overwhelmed by that training at the last minute. Does anybody have questions about those? You know, that's just obviously an overview of responsibilities of licensed foster providers. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the, uh, uh, the visits. Um, do we, are they to visit the kids at the foster parents' home, or the parents are taking the kids to visit. I mean, their yeah, their family, or is both you. ways. Which yeah, is which? thanks. That's a great question. Rarely would the parents visit at the foster home. Sometimes, okay. if it's a relative, like if I'm grandma and I have my grandkids, I might have my child come visit at the home, right? Because mm -hmm. it's my child. Okay. Um, but that wouldn't be typical for a non-relative foster mm -hmm. provider. Usually the visits would happen someplace outside the foster home. And mm -hmm. you wouldn't be going to the mother's home either. You would meet someplace in the community. Okay. Yeah. And it wouldn't necessarily be the foster parent supervising the visit. It would, it might be someone else supervising the visit too. Um, we have case aides who sometimes supervise the visits. Um, we don't have that many case aides, so they don't always supervise the visits. There's a, you know, they can't supervise every visit. So they might ask the foster parent to supervise the visit if they're comfortable doing that. Um, sometimes we, there are agencies that that's all they do is supervise visits. So maybe the foster parent would just be doing transportation to the visit and then someone from the agency would supervise the visit. So there's lots of different arrangements, but no, typically they wouldn't come to your house for the visit. Okay. Thanks, Josephine, that was a great question. Okay, yeah. So I also want just for that visit too. So when you when they are doing this visit, you just take the child to the, to, to the parent drop the child and then just leave them and then come back and pick them up or you are present with them where the kids are visiting? Um, there's all different arrangements. Sometimes okay. you might be there. Sometimes you might just leave and pick them okay. up. Yeah, yeah. It really depends. Okay. That's something that you would work out with, say, the, the social worker. You would work that out with the social worker. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. You're welcome. I have another question on the the yearly trainings. Okay. So those, those twelve hours, are, is it like spread out throughout the year, or you can just take them as they come? So you can spread it out throughout the year. And usually what we licensors do is we send you, we'll send our foster parents different trainings and say, hey, we thought this might be interesting to you. 
hey, you might want to register for this training or you might want to log on and watch this training. It might you might like to do this. So those trainings are optional, but it's a way to get your training hours in. So you might say, oh, yeah, I want to do that one or nah, that doesn't look interesting to me. But we'll send you trainings throughout the year that you can do. Or you might say, oh, I, I do a lot of training through Head Start. I'm going to just use my Head Start training as my training. And then just check with your licensor that that will count towards foster care. Or someone else, Shikari might say, oh, I um, listened to this podcast about, you know, mental health. I'm going to use that for my training. I'm going to check with my licensor and see if that works. So you can pick and choose other trainings, even stuff that we don't send you. Okay. If it counts towards, you know, if it's relevant, or maybe you read a book, you know, a memoir about a kid who was in foster care, that'll work. So you guys can use your own, you guys can have your own ideas too. Okay. Um, and we have a form that we'll give you to fill out. It's like an ind independent study form that we can give you to fill out. So there's all different ways to get training. But we do provide resources to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we want to make sure that it's really clear who has custody of the children in foster care, because even if you have a child living in your home and you're providing foster care, you do not have custody of that child. You don't have legal authority over that child. We want to make sure that that's really clear because we don't want anybody to get into trouble for making decisions that they're not authorized to make. Um, so you do have physical custody of a child in your care. OK. However, you don't have legal custody. The agency, Ramsey County, has legal custody over the children in foster care. So the social worker who placed that child, in other words, usually the child protection worker, that's the individual who has legal authority over that child. So they would be the person to make legal decisions for that child. So if that child, for example, needed a medical procedure, it would be Ramsey County who would have to authorize that medical procedure, okay? Any kind of big decisions for that child would have to be made by the social worker. So just wanna make sure that everybody understands that. Now, what we usually do is we give our foster parents a letter that says you guys can make basic decisions for the child. Like you can take them to their medical appointments and have basic medical done so that you guys can get dental cleanings, physical exams, you know, uh, wellness checks and things like that. But for anything that requires um, anything more invasive than that, you would have to get signed off by um, the legal authority, okay? So um, just want to make sure that, that, that that's understood. And that also goes for school decisions. Like you wouldn't be able to switch the child's school without, um, without authorization, okay? Even something, this might sound kind of crazy, but even cutting a child's hair, you can't cut a child's, you can't change a child's hairstyle, cut a child's hair without authorization because in some cultures you know hair is a, a really big deal and we wouldn't so just across the board we don't let anyone and even we as the agency we don't change a child's hair without the parents authorization so that's the kind of thing that the parents are retaining that right we don't make that decision that goes back to the parents so it gets a little, you know, you just want to make sure that we all have to make sure that we stay in our lanes. And if we have questions about, can I, can I do this? Do I need to ask? Do I need permission? Just ask. Foster parents do basic day-to-day -day care, health, and, um, you know, daily family care 
um, but any kind of bigger, bigger things we have to get permissions for. So like the, you can see right below, it says the do's and don'ts. Don't sign for approval of medical procedures. Do, okay, this is a big one too. Do get written permission prior to any out-of-state travel because crossing state lines is kind of a big deal with a foster kid. So file that one in your back pocket too. And then, and, and I'm sure you'll hear that repeated once or twice. And then don't sign any education plans or IEPs either. That would, that's something that has to be signed by um, the social worker too. And if there's an IEP meeting, the social worker would be there for that. So I don't think anybody would even ask you to sign that, but if they did just, you know, just say, you know what, I think that the social worker has to sign that. So I think a good rule is if anybody asks you to sign something for the child, you might just say, you know what, I got to check with the social worker, see if I can sign this. And a good standard line is, I'm a foster parent. I'm not sure I can sign this. Questions on that? This is just a good little visual of what, what foster parents do. I just threw some things in these little circles and blobs, things that I thought of that foster parents do. See the good, daily needs, let kids be kids, transportation, part of the team, nurture and guide help kids grow, keep kids safe, mentor, provide. What am I forgetting? Who has one that I should have included? I'm sure I didn't think of all of them. Love. I didn't see love there. Love. There you go. How did I forget that? There. Fixed. <laughs> <clears throat> what do you think you guys well i think they need to be um good role models provide um Opportunity for growth and education. Say that again. I missed that. Um, I said I think um, they have to be. Um, we have to be good role models. Yeah. And then um, also give the child the, um, the opportunity to grow and provide education. I don't know how to add a circle, so I'm going to have to add it to something. That's okay. Love it. I'll figure out how to add a circle later, but for now we'll just do it like that. Good ideas. Oops, that's not where I want that comma. I can't make it work. Well, okay. Anybody else? All right, strained your brains. You guys are almost out of time. All right. I have one question though. Yes. So mentor, you said mentor birth family. I don't understand that. Um, 
in some cases, hopefully in a lot of cases, the foster parent can, you know, we talked about um, contacting the family and talking to the family, those comfort calls. Okay. In some cases that will help develop into a relationship with the family, with the parents. And um, like somebody said, well, somebody said being a role model, not just to the kids, but maybe to the parents about this is what a healthy family looks like. And let us help you learn to be a healthy family. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. When to notify your licensing worker. Um, so like I said, we're going to meet with you every month. Okay. At least to begin with, but you might need to get in touch with us in between those meetings. Um, always notify us before a foster child moves in. Okay. Always notify us if a placement ends or a child moves from your home. Okay. We need to know what's going on. Um, also, if you have a change in household members, if someone moves in or moves out, for example, I have a child moving out of my home because she's going to college in a few months. So if I was licensed, I would need to notify my licensor about that. Um, any changes like change of app, obviously if you're moving, we need to know, but if your telephone number changes, your contact information, or if you have a big life-changing event, please let us know. Um, if you're gonna, we, I already mentioned this, but if you're gonna travel out of state with a foster child, we need to know about that in advance. Um, if there's an emergency that involves your foster child, um, let us know about that. If there's an emergency involving you, like if you wind up in the hospital, um, we should know about that too. And, and it's not because we want to get all, all up in your business, but we just, we want to know because it, it is potentially affecting the care of the child. Okay. Um, and then if you really feel like you can't do, um, you can't manage the placement, um, we really want a 45 day notice because it takes time to find another placement for a child. We really hope that before it gets to that point that we have worked really hard with you to preserve that placement, to make it work for you and for the child. So we, we really hope we don't get a call out of the blue saying, um, I can't do this. We hope that we've talked and worked together to make it work before that happens. But if it's, if it's just not the right fit, um, it happens, but but we do need that kind of notice unless there's a real safety concern. Um, we we need that kind of notice to make sure we can find a an appropriate placement for that child. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Yeah, one, one more question, please. Yes, yes. If you have somebody visiting you from or family member just visiting, maybe spend the night and then go uh -huh. to what, what, do I have to notify the social worker about that? That's a good question too. So if you have a frequent visitor or a visitor who's staying for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. um, I don't remember exact what the exact requirements are for those things. Um, then we would need to do a background study, okay? okay? Otherwise, no, it's okay. Okay. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so these are just a few of the people involved in um, your life once you're licensed for foster care. The birth parents are going to be involved in your life, okay? The foster, well, you're the foster parents. The licensor is going to be involved in your life. The placing worker i.e. the child protection worker. There are other people who are gonna be involved in your life. Like I said, the, the child's teachers, the therapists, the court system, the guardian ad litem. There might be a child um, children's law center attorney who might be involved in your life. The, the point is they're gonna, you're gonna have a lot of new and interesting people involved in your life. And some of those people are gonna be in your house. And some of those people are gonna be in your business. So um, it's just it's just a reality of this. So um, it's just something that you have to understand as part of it. Um, and if you're going to do this, you just have to 
kind of, I can't tell you, you have to be okay with it, but you have to understand it's part of it. Um, so we've talked about the QPI, the Quality Parenting Initiative. Um, QPI, um, it's this is what the, the organization that um, has taught us about the comfort calls. And you guys will all do a training about the comfort right. calls and... Um, Ron and Yolanda. Mute yourselves, please. Exactly. I gave my what time is it? About two minutes to. Uh, she Ron and Yolanda, mute uh, yourself. She asked us something. What? What? Mute, your, mute, your, mute yourselves. Again. Mute yourself. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's the organization that has taught us about doing the comfort calls, um, which, um, like it says, strengthens the relationship between the parents and the foster providers in an effort to um, increase the odds of reunification um, between the parents and the children. The goal is for the parents and the bio parents to work as a team and um, make things better for the child, basically. So uh, in the interest of time, I won't belabor that, but um, that is the goal of those comfort calls. Um, you'll do the training, you'll learn more about it and the social workers will help you with those comfort calls. We don't like make you cold call bio parents, social workers help you with that. Payment. Um, in order to be paid for foster care, when a child moves into your home, someone called a MAPSI oh. assessor will call you. Oh, and sorry. Someone called a MAPSI assessor will call you and do an assessment on the needs of the children. Um, and there is always a base rate of pay. And based on the needs of the children, that base rate can be accelerated if the children's needs are um, in accordance with an accelerated rate. Once the children's needs are established and that rate of pay is established, um, you will get a monthly invoice form to fill out. The form is very simple. Um, you just write on the number of days that the child was in your care during the month um, and you submit that form and payment is generated. Now, when a child moves in with you, it there is a delay in payment. You will get paid for all the days the children are with you. However, there is a delay. It's kind of like when you start a new job, there's like a pay cycle that you don't get paid and then it catches up to you. It's the same thing, okay? Um, we talked about Head Start. We had the presentation about Head Start. Child care can be a real barrier for foster care because there is no payment vehicle for child care in foster care. Um, that's why I really feel like things like Head Start are really important for foster parents to be aware of. There are also grants like that Think Small grant. So if you have kids who are um, daycare age, please talk to your licensor or your placing worker about those grants. It's really important because the foster care payments do not cover the cost of, of daycare, okay? Um, kids in foster care qualify for health care. They all are covered by health care. They also qualify for WIC. They also qualify for free school lunch. So make sure you take advantage of these benefits. Okay, any kid in foster care qualifies for this stuff. It doesn't, your income is not a consideration. Kids in foster care also qualify for clothing allowances. Kids in foster care sometimes come with very little. They also grow. That may surprise you, they grow um, and they need new things. So you can talk to your workers about getting them a clothing allowance. Okay, just mention that and, and the workers will work with you on that. Lastly, I just wanna say a quick word about self-care. Um, you guys, this is hard. You need to take care of yourselves. Please um, tend to your own needs. Be aware of your own limitations. Um, if there's something that gets under your skin, be aware of that. Don't let it 
get the best of you, give yourself breaks. Um, we do have respite care. If you want to um, take a weekend to yourself, ask your workers about respite. If you have a network of people who can help you, don't feel like you have to do it all yourself. Ask your friends and family, can you come over and give me a break? I need a break. Don't, don't be shy about doing that. That's what our friends and family are for. Ask your worker for suggestions and resources. Let us help you. Whoop. Uh-oh, what did I do? There we go. Um, respite care um, is another licensed provider who can take the children to another licensed home while you get a break. The kids will be safely cared for and you get a break. Substitute caregivers um, are people in your circle who can get you a break. Substitute caregivers may need some training, may need a background study, but do not need to be licensed. Ask your worker for more information. A babysitter does not need specialized training. A babysitter is just a babysitter, okay? Your worker can give you more information about how all this breaks down, but it's just really important, really important for you to get a break. I don't know what I keep doing here. There's also a foster parent support group. Can you guys still see this? There's also yeah. a foster parent support group. Um, it meets every month. Um, and your, again, your worker can get you this information, but I just wanted you to know that it's out there. It meets the fourth Monday of each month. It's currently on Zoom. It used to be live. It was pretty cool. They did, they babysat the kids. They gave the kids dinner and the adults met. It's now on Zoom since the pandemic and they haven't gone back to live. Um, but, uh-oh. Sorry, I think I'm about to fade. But um, it's still a good group. They, they do a topic and then they let people just talk. Good thing we're almost done because I'm having technical issues. How can we help? Placing workers and kinship workers strive to place children with caring and qualified relatives and to maintain those placements. When relative placement isn't possible, we want to match families to children. We don't match children to families. We don't say, I want a child who's like this. No, we want children to be matched to appropriate adults, not adults to children. Um, we want to um, work with foster families to support you in getting licensed and to keep the kids in placements um, with, with the best families. Um, we wanna provide you with resources. We want to train you to help you grow and learn and be your best for the kids. We are we licensors are your worker. We are here for you. The the CP workers are they're working with the parents. They're working with the kids. They're working with a lot of different people. Licensors are really your worker. We're done. Please hit me with any questions that you have not asked. I do need it. I have a question. I missed something, Barb. Uh, did I hear you say? 13 and under does not need a, a background or do they? I missed 13, that. 13 to 17 needs a background check, Yolanda. 12 and under does not need a background check. Okay. Can you, I forgot, I talked to Trutau, with, I don't know her name, yeah. but how would I go about doing that? I think she might've sent me something, but I'm not finding it. Uh, how would I, John, snap her in. Okay, um, how would I go about for the 13 year old? Cause he just turned 13 in February. Yeah, you can just email True and let uh, her know. Or I think she's gonna be out to your place sometime soon. Yeah, yeah hopefully all this virus is gone. Oh, okay, okay. And, that RFB and the baby was in the hospital. Okay. I was in the hospital cause I ended up with it. They ended up had to uh, intubate me. Oh gosh! So it, it, it everything's looking good around here now. Okay. Baby had her first follow up from the hospital today, so she she looks good. She's doing great. You know what? I'm gonna stop recording, everybody. One second. <laughs>